Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again, where thanks to the very awesome people who support me on Patreon, people like David Kowalski and Liam Hutchinson, I get to talk about a film that I've wanted to talk about on this channel for a very long time. A film with more Bond connections than I think most people realise. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Uh, the story itself coming from the fount of all Bond itself. Mr. Ian Fleming. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang the book was published in October 1964. Fleming had written the book for his young son, which is very sweet, but sadly Fleming passed away a few months prior to the publication and was never able to enjoy its success. Fleming based Chitty herself on two specific cars, a standard Tourer that he had spent some time driving himself, and a customised Mercedes that was actually called Chitty Bang Bang, which Fleming had seen in a race. The book was, of course, the basis for the 1968 film, which was produced by one of the Bond series producers at the time, Albert R. Broccoli. The film takes many liberties with the source material, but it is probably the definitive version of what people think of when they think of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, no doubt partly due to the catchy title song and the iconic design of the car. The film begins with a title sequence set over a montage of Grand Prix races, where we see one particular car winning each and every time. It's during this sequence that Bond geeks like us will be noticing many a familiar name pop up in the credits, including John Steers, Cliff Cully, Peter Lamont, Peter Hunt, Ken Adam, Roald Dahl, Richard Maybaum, Stanley Sopel, and even co-writer and director Ken Hughes has some James Bond notoriety after being one of the many directors involved with the 1960s version of Casino Royale. The film was a real childhood favourite of mine, and I I just think it's interesting to like look back as an adult like I have memories of this film before I have memories of Bond and it's just interesting to see all of the Bond DNA that's kind of embedded into almost every aspect of the film and I'm really appreciative that Broccoli did assemble as much of the Bond cinematic team to make this film as he did. After seeing the winning race car burnt to cinders and a couple of stuntmen hopefully getting some extra danger pay performing this, we jump to sometime in the near future where the car is languishing at a provincial garage but delighting a couple of small local children, Jeremy and Jemima, who enjoy playing in it. Bond fans will of course recognise the owner of the garage played by Bond's very own Q, Desmond Llewellyn. This was once a great car! Won the Grand Prix, three years running! Now pay attention children, if you open up the rusty panel next to the gear stick you'll find two large vermin living in there. Whatever you do, don't touch them. They have hepatitis. Some mean-spirited killjoy sees the car, and presumably because he gets his kicks from destroying the fun of children everywhere, offers Q some money for the car and relishes in telling the distraught young people that he will melt the car down for parts. We're gonna put her in the clapper, and we're gonna crunch her up till she's one solid piece of metal. Then we're gonna put her in the fiery furnace, and we're gonna melt her down till she's liquid iron. That's what we're gonna do with her. Well, he seems nice. The children propose that their father will buy the car for them. I mean, good luck with that, kids. It didn't work for me and my dad when I asked him for an Aston Martin when I was eight years old, but presumably they'll have more luck than I did. En route home, they off-road a passing vehicle driven by Truly Scrumptious, played by Sally Ann Howes, doing her best Julie Andrews performance. Bond fans may notice the license plate here, referencing the name of Albert R. Cubby Broccoli. You know you might have been killed! Truly quite rightly takes issue with the children not being in school and returns them home, where we meet the star of the film, Caractacus Potts, played by the ever-fantastic Dick Van Dyke. He doesn't seem too fussed about his kids being out of school and is far more interested in working on his various wacky inventions, and this causes some conflicts between him and Truly right off the bat. I mean, is there anyone on Earth, though, who doesn't like Dick Van Dyke? He's such a warm and ever-likable screen presence, I just really can't fathom how anyone could dislike him popping up in anything. He brings such a great energy to everything he does. He and Truly have some great catty chemistry in these opening scenes, and obviously seeing Van Dyke with a Julie Andrews look-alike conjures up memories of Mary Poppins, which is quite clearly something of a blueprint for this film. I mean, beyond that obvious uh, aesthetic thing, then there's the Sherman Brothers composing the songs for the movie, and they worked on Mary Poppins too, so that is clearly the benchmark of family entertainment that this film is aiming for. Whether or not it hits those dizzying heights, we'll get into a little later, but shortly after Truly departs we get the first musical number of the film, U2, which is such a lovely song and serves to reassure us that despite Potts taking a very casual view of his offspring state-sponsored education, he is nonetheless a loving father. I have you two. Someone to do for, Martin's room for. I have you two. 
also introduced early in the film is Lionel Jeffries as Potts' father, though there's no explanation for why Potts himself is clearly an American man despite his own dad and children being English, but you know what, it saves us from a no doubt terrible maul of an English accent from Dick Van Dyke, so we can all count our blessings, I suppose. It's around here that the kids bring up their idea of having their dad buy the car wreck, and he reacts with some natural hesitation, but especially after the U2 song, it's clear that he obviously would hate to disappoint his children, and despite this being such a heartwarming, eccentric, and lovely family unit, the absence of a mother figure conveys an underlying sadness to the situation, and presumably Potts is feeling like he has to compensate for the lack of a traditional upbringing by appeasing his children's whims. But not that the kids ever come across as spoiled or bratty, rather they're just perhaps somewhat naive to the realities of life, and quite possibly because of the eccentricity of their upbringing. Okay, so I like these kids a lot, and I think they play the parts very well, and they're very sweet and cute, but every now and then they just get so shrill that it's kind of painful on the ears. The next half hour or so of the film concerns Potts' attempts at raising the necessary 30 shillings to buy the car, including flogging his latest sweetie invention to the Scrumptious Empire, run by the father of Truly, who takes an interest in helping Potts make the necessary sale to the blustery Mr. Scrumptious. This prompts a musical number around the factory, which is so wonderful. The set designs by Ken Adam allow for some really cool asymmetrical dance routines that I just love so much is just ever so slightly off-kilter and then exaggerated in wonderful ways. This is obviously the film's attempt at recreating some of the Chim Chimney dance numbers from Mary Poppins, but I actually prefer the stuff we get here. I just love the setting and everyone zipping around on these trays of sweets. It's so lovely. The USP of the sweets, known as Toot Sweets, is that they have holes in them which can be blown through to produce little tunes, or act as dog whistles, which is what ends up scuppering Potts' attempt at a sale when he brings about a pack of dogs who descend upon the clearly very poorly security protected factory. This whole sequence is then for gotten about for much of the running time, but it does end up playing an important part in the story later on. Potts's second and more immediately successful attempt at raising the money has him using his hair cutting invention, which of course goes wrong and prompts a chase around a fair with a disgruntled customer. Love the cameo appearance of Barbara Windsor during this sequence, but anyway, Potts ends up in a dance troupe to evade his would-be attacker and starts dancing, and again, this is just such a fantastic and well choreographed sequence. Potts is usually just a beat or two behind all the other dancers as he tries his best to fit in with them, but it all goes so well that he gets many a coin lobbed at him at the end of the performance, which he uses to buy the car wreck and sets about repairing it, which I don't think was necessarily a part of the children's expectations, but everybody needs a hobby and what he produces ends up being one of the most iconic vehicles in all of cinema. The kids are obviously delighted by this, and the family decide to go on a picnic, sans grandpa, who is characteristically negative about his son's achievement. Get a board, grandpa! Come on! It'll never go, my dears! I just love how he delivers that line, like, you morons, of course it won't work. I just love this guy's character, actually. He's very loving with his grandkids, but he's so sassy and wisecracking when it comes to his own son. And a big character trait of his is that he gets all dressed up in order to visit his outhouse. And we'll get a little look inside later on, and I, I, I always assumed this was supposed to be a toilet, but later on it doesn't look like there is a toilet in there, but I, I just kind of loved the idea that he was getting all dressed up dead fancy to go and have a poo. It's something that I found very funny as a kid, and his delight in telling everyone he meets that he's going to some fantastic adventure before disappearing inside is just so great. Anyway, the ride to the picnic spot prompts the film's classic title song, and all this stuff with them driving around, the scenery, the music, it's all such lovely stuff. Truly is off-roaded again, though, and joins the group on their picnic by the beach, which prompts the children to sing a song about how truly scrumptious, truly scrumptious is. I love the name, truly scrumptious, and it is very much like a kid-appropriate version of a double entendre Bond girl name, like Pussy Galore or Holly Goodhead, but hearing the kids singing about how truly scrumptious this lady is does make them come across like little Hannibal Lecters. Well, truly, have the sweets stopped tooting? <laughs> After all this horsing around, the family pack up to go, and this is where the film very much branches off for most of its second half. Potts begins telling the kids a story, and for just over an hour of screen time, we see this story acted out. It's a 
really extended fantasy sequence, if you will, and it still bothers me that so much of this film is just a story within a story. It's very much a film of two halves, and as much as I enjoy the first half, it's Potts' story here, which I really love, and I have no idea why the filmmakers felt the need to have half the story as a fantasy sequence. I mean, it's hardly like the film has been so grounded in reality to this point that the target audience would reject all the larger-than-life things that happen later on in the story, but whatever. So here we're introduced to Baron Bomburst, played by Goldfinger himself, Gert Frobe, who has travelled to England from Bulgaria to steal the phantasmagorical Chitty for himself, and it's here where Chitty really does take on a life of her own, becoming somewhat sentient and inflating herself into a hovercraft, which prompts a really well-filmed chase on the water, barring some rather poor back projection work. The Baron sends along two spies to locate the car and steal it for him. I love these two guys. They have a Laurel and Hardy thing going on and are given such weird makeup. They look like they're right out of a silent film, but it works so well. And I think they're just great physical comedians. They sell all the cartoony slapstick of their antics so well. Less enjoyable, I find, is the pause the movie takes to give us Truly's signature song, Lovely Lonely Man, which she sings around her home at the <laughs> Spectre training camp from From Russia With Love, apparently. Don't get me wrong, the song is lovely and Sally Ann Howes is just a fantastic singer and she performs it so well. It's all really well filmed, but when I was a kid, this was the bit that I'd fast forward through, especially as it's placed in between some fun slapstick action. It just brings the pace right down, and when I was six years old watching this, I really couldn't care less about her lovey-dovey feelings. I love that this is presumably a part of Mr. Potts's whole, like, storytelling, so I, I can only imagine how awkward it must have been in the car to be, like, listening to this, and then he goes into, and then truly starts singing a song about how much she loves me and how much she wants to be with me. Anyway, while the foursome are gallivanting around in their new motor car, the spies arrive at the Potts' home and mistake Grandpa for the inventor Potts. They hilariously mistake his outhouse as his laboratory, so the Baron arrives in his Zeppelin to kidnap both in the hope that they can return them to Volcaria and he can build him his own Chitty. The remaining Potts and Truly see their abducted family member and pursue, eventually going over some cliffs where Chitty reveals her most exciting feature, that she can fly. I remember thinking this was so awesome when I was a kid. Like, she goes on land, water, and air, and just the design of this car is stunning. It's such an iconic piece of work. Anyway, they get a little lost in some clouds and lose sight of the Zeppelin so they don't get to see Grandpa's own musical number. Posh is really just a song where Grandpa sings ironically about the state of his travels. It does so little to advance the story in any way, but it's just delightful to listen to and Lionel Jeffries performs it so well. It plays out while the Baron is ejecting his pair of spies to lighten the load, and I love that even though Grandpa has just been kidnapped by these people, he's still attempting to be helpful. You just dropped someone! Much of the final hour of the film is set in the fictional country of Bulgaria, a land where children are outlawed and the elite of the land occupy a fantastic castle. Again, some typical awesome Ken Adam design here. I love the portrayal of the nobility. Like, everyone in this castle has a very distinct black, white, grey, and purple colour palette, and everyone just looks so hideously decrepit and demented, and there's just so much going on in all these shots. I especially love this guy who's, like, fishing on the stone floor or something. It also becomes clear here that the Baron himself is just a massive, petulant man-child, and he just sees Chitty as being the most fabulous toy in the world, which is why he's so obsessed about having one himself. I love the concept of all these middle-aged, hideous people outlawing children from their land while engaging in all the playful activities of children themselves. Yep. Gert Frobe is just phenomenal as the Baron. He has just the right level of goofy menace and bluster to make him a super silly villain, but he's got such a bulldog face and wields such power that he is still nonetheless quite a threatening figure at times. This is, of course, juxtaposed with the moments where he behaves like a spoiled brat, and not every actor could really nail all these different aspects, but combining his talent with his physicality just makes him such a delight to watch. But if you fail... I will stuff your head with sauerkraut and feed it to the ducks! Grandpa is led to a laboratory inside the castle full of fellow kidnapped old men who have been put to work designing a fantastical motor car for the Baron. If only the Baron knew there was a man nearby who would quite easily perform such a feat, he wouldn't need this entire team of people. Anyway, we get another Grandpa song here, The Roses of Success. And if I were putting on my studio exec note cap for a second, 
I'd say there's really no reason why we need to have two grandpa songs in such quick succession. Like, the common sense would be to just have one, and I mean, we haven't seen much of the other Potsers and Truly and Chitty in a while. And, and yet, despite that, all the music in this film is so well done, and I don't think the Sherman Brothers ever composed a bad song. So, while the story may be put on hold for a little while, it's nonetheless delightful just to bask in the fun and the choreography and the tunes. Anyway, Chitty and Co. arrive in Vulgaria, and lacking the art of subtlety, proceed to fly around the castle. Like, maybe Truly should have attended some of those Spectre training courses taking place in her own backyard, and they'd know not to do this, but of course, this gives the game away to the Baron, who unleashes his forces to find the car. Wandering into the nearby town, the heroes are sheltered by a local toy maker played by Benny Hill. Now, I really like Benny Hill, and a lot of his comedy is timeless and classic, but in the role of the toy maker, he never has much of an opportunity to showcase his talents. It's a surprisingly genuine and sweet performance, which perfectly fits the role, and Hill is great in this role. I'm just surprised that they'd go to the effort of casting Benny Hill if they're not going to utilize a lot of his comedic talents more. While the family hide in the cellar, we are introduced to the nightmare-inducing spawn of hell itself, the child catcher. Along with Chitty herself, I think the child catcher is most certainly one of the most iconic things about this film. The role is just so, so perfectly played by Robert Heltman, and I mean, I don't know if I've seen this guy in anything else, and I had no idea before doing a little research for this review, but he was actually a ballet dancer as well as an actor and choreographer, and he's certainly utilizing all of his talents here for this part. The way he moves is equal parts graceful and feral. He just kind of glides around the scenery on his tiptoes with that terrifying hook and the glee on his face as he thinks he's getting getting nearer and nearer to finding the kids. He's just the stuff of nightmares. I mean, the heroes manage to evade him this time, but Chitty is captured and Potts and the toy maker go to wrecky the palace while the kids complain about being hungry, which is not entirely unreasonable considering they flew from England to presumably Central Europe overnight and presumably didn't make a pit stop at a service station en route for some overpriced sandwiches and coffee. Truly leaves the kids alone for a bit to go and find some food and the child catcher makes his second appearance in disguise as a terrifying confectionery salesman, and the kids are somehow fooled by this. Lollipops. And all free today. Well, he seems nice. Like, really? You were face to face with this guy not a few minutes ago, and now a bright jacket and some lollipops is all it takes to make you think he's someone else? And even if he was someone else, he's still freaking disturbing. Like, if you have kids and want to encourage them not to talk to strangers, just show them this film, and my god, they won't make eye contact with anyone they don't know for the rest of their lives. Of course the kids are captured, but maybe they had a lucky escape given that it looks like all truly was bringing them back with some lettuce and potatoes? Um, yeah, actually, I'd take my chances with the horrific candy salesman as well if that was my only other option. The children are brought before the Baron and the Baroness, played by Anna Quayle, who very much treats the children like terrifying wild animals and the kids are promptly whisked off to jail. Meanwhile, the toy maker takes Potts and Truly to a secret cavern underneath the castle where we see the exiled children from the village have taken refuge, foraging for scraps of food from the castle above. It's quite a touching scene and in no small part down to the reprise we get of Hushabai Mountain, a very sweet song that Potts had earlier sung to his children as a lullaby. Next to the title song, this is probably the one that has had the most life of its own outside of the film, and it's clear to see why it's a beautiful, reassuring song, and so gently delivered by Dick Van Dyke. Am I admitting too much by saying this song actually brings a tear to my eye? It's so lovely. I mean, particularly the bits where Potts is so overcome by emotion he can't continue singing, so truly has to join in and help him finish the song. I do love, though, how any sentimentality brought about by the song is so swiftly under undercut by the toy maker and truly here. Is that the only advice you have to offer, my friend? It's a beautiful dream, Caractacus, but I don't see how it's going to help them. Yes, why don't you do something practical like bring us some bloody food and blankets, for Christ's sake? The scene ends with Potts coming up with a plan to restore justice in Vulgaria before we cut to the Baron on the morning of his birthday, greeting his wife with a... Happy birthday, Baron, indeed. Good lord, this is a kid's film, right? I mean, what the heck is going on here? It's a good job the Baroness is a blonde, otherwise I wouldn't know where the lace ends and the muff begins. Anyway, it's time for the pair's own song, Chitchy Face, which is another one of my favourites. It's a sickly sweet song about how much the pair love each other, and it plays out while the Baron attempts to assassinate the Baroness in a variety of creative ways. I don't know why the Baron is so hell-bent on murdering his wife. Like, I think the film tries to sell as Anna Quayle's character as this kind 
kind of like grotesque creature, but I think she actually looks quite sexy in this film. And I guess it, it, it does serve well to convey the idea that the Baron doesn't think of women in a very sexualized way, rather he just thinks of them as being figures who are going to stop him from playing with his toys. I want to give a special shout out to Gert Frobe's fantastic evil cackle and incredible intake of breath. <laughs> That is such an extreme intake of air, like, I'm surprised he didn't just inhale her right back up. I, I really can't express enough how much I love Gert Frobe and Anna Quayle in these parts. They are so perfectly pitched as ridiculous characters with just the right level of villainy. The Baron's birthday party commences and is as grotesque as you'd expect. So horrible that even the Baron himself is having a miserable time until the toy maker arrives with a couple of special presents for the Baron in the form of Truly and Potts posing as... Robots or something? I love how easily convinced everyone is. Like, this toy maker was working on Jack in the Boxes and Wooden Horses, and now it's like, Hi everyone, care to hear about the natural laws I defied in order to create these sentient beings? I feel like I'm saying this about every song in this film at this rate, but Truly Sings Doll in a Music Box here, which is another of my absolute favourite songs in the film. From a character perspective, it suits her really well too. Sally Ann House has played Truly as quite, I mean, she plays her quite down to earth, and she never comes across as too hoity-toity or above the rest of the characters in terms of social standing. Potts made the accusation of her when she unmeaningly made light of his inventions earlier on in the film, and the children certainly view her as some sort of otherworldly entity, so it feels right that she sings this song somewhat ironically I think of you know being a doll in a music box waiting for love's first kiss longing to be free being gazed at the film never really develops her private life enough for this to ever really be apparent but based on the inferences that we get throughout the film it sounds like she lives life on a pedestal somewhat and when she's just goofing around with Potts and the kids she feels like she's really able to let loose and have fun without the expectations that she's lived with all of her life when Potts joins in the song, it's just a magical experience between these two people, and this is the moment where I think we're supposed to really buy that these two have fallen in love, and you know what, I buy it, and I love it, and I love these two, um, but while all this is happening, the Baron notices that something fishy is afoot, and joins them on the dance floor, prompting the beginning of the film's exciting climax as the outlawed children and oppressed townsfolk take over the castle. Yes, liberty, my friends, vive la Bulgaria, where there is state, there can be no freedom, but where there is freedom, there will be no state. <coughs> <laughs> I'm a bit carried away there. Um, it's a really fun battle, and it's good to see all these grotesque old people get their comeuppance by the rioting children. The child catcher in particular, though, I would have liked something a bit more for him. It doesn't feel completely satisfying that he's just caught in a net and that's it. Not saying that I want this to go Game of Thrones and his head to be outside the castle on a spike, but something a bit more punishing for him would have been good and more satisfying, I think. In the middle of all this action, I love that we get a cutaway gag of those two spies from earlier swimming up to the bank of the castle, like they've just literally spent all of this time swimming. The Baron and Baroness attempt something of a getaway down a secret chute, which I guess would lead them to the office of Tiger Tanaka in Japan. I love that this slide was presumably just hanging around and someone was like, uh, yeah, we might have another use for that, you know. Or maybe it was just a permanent fixture at the Eon office and this is how Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson travel into their office every day. Of course, the villains are captured and Chitty, much like the Potts children and the outlaws, are freed. I wish Chitty did more in this climax rather than just appear to pick up the Potts and truly though, like, uh, as the battle is finishing. Uh, considering the car disappears from from the film for a good chunk of the third act, it might have been nice to have her somewhat involved in apprehending at least one of the main baddies. The boxers make the correct decision in making a quick getaway after the action is done, lest they be present to see the rise and inevitable fall of socialism in Bulgaria. Rather, Chitty goes into flight mode and they are out of here. Stand back on the propellers. Keep clear. Hey mom, look. Propellers. By this point, you've probably forgotten that we were ever in a complete fantasy sequence to begin with, so it is quite disappointing when we fade back to the family and truly on the beach, and it's made clear that this was all just the ramblings of one man, who then proceeds to get all shirty when his children come to the conclusion that the story would end with he and truly getting married. And Daddy and truly were married, and lived happily ever after. Yeah. 
don't know why you're so aghast at that, dude. Like, you were the one who went on a massive tangent about how this lady sang a song about how much she loves you and wants to be with you, and now he's all like, Oh my, what a preposterous thing to say! Paul and Truly part on a bit of a sour note, and the family return home to find Truly's dad there. Remember him from the Sweet Factory earlier on? Yeah, well, that wasn't just a mad tangent. It turns out that Mr. Scrumptious actually loves the idea of marketing the Toot Sweets as dog treats. As such, the Potsers are going to be millionaires, and because money is the root of all social standing and prestige, I guess this means that Potts feels like he can go and marry Truly now? I just kind of assumed he wasn't quite over his last wife, and that's why he wasn't ready to commit to another woman, but it turns out a few million quid is all you need, and I know that they have made points during the film about how Potts acknowledges that he and Truly are from different walks of life and everything, and he uses that as an excuse why the two can't be together, but... I suppose beyond money, really the reason that Potts gives as to why he feels like he must dash to Truly and tell her that he loves her is because... I have succeeded! I always knew you would! And, you know what, I think it's really sweet, like, for everything that I just said, it's really sweet that he considers, like, he had to feel like he was a success, and I, I don't think he is judging this entirely on the basis of financial gain. I think he just felt like he wasn't good enough for her because he's never had anything, he's never had any adventure that has succeeded, and, you know, she deserves better, and the success of the Toot Sweets was just the validation he needed in order to feel like he's actually good, and given this newfound confidence, he bounds right over to her, and the film ends with the pair kissing and flying up into the air in Chitty, implying that the fantasy sequence earlier on might have not all been entirely fantasy. So that's the story of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and if I hadn't made it clear by this point, I really, really love this film. I think it's one of the greatest family movies of all time. It has such a great, fun, jolly tone throughout. It's full of whimsy and adventure and so much humour, even surreal humour, that really just hits my sweet spot. The cast are phenomenal and everyone seems to fully understand what kind of movie they're in and what they're expected to bring and they judge their performances perfectly. I think the movie is quite gorgeous looking too. I, it's quite telling that this movie is directed by Ken Hughes, the guy who directed the Berlin segments of the 60s Casino Royale spoof film, which happened to be my favourite bit of that film. His frames are so often full of just so many fun details and partnered with Ken Adams' phenomenal set design. It's just a gorgeous movie to look at. And of course, I can't not mention the Sherman Brothers, whose fantastic songs and music just bring so much to this film. Am I nuts to say that I like this soundtrack more than I like their music for Mary Poppins or The Jungle Book or any other film that they've done? I just think the music here is so, so good. And for those of you who may wonder why I've spent 30 minutes rabbiting on about a kid's film on a channel that is primarily about James Bond and spy movies, I can't emphasize enough just how much of that Bond cinematic DNA runs through so much of this movie that make it a delight for me as a Bond fan to experience. Now, I know that Chitty wasn't produced by Eon Productions, but Cubby Broccoli certainly brought over enough of the right people from the Bond series to make this movie really excel. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang can stand quite proudly next to some of the greatest family films of all time, in, to my mind. It, it just has a nice timeless quality to it and uh, a little bit of a personal aside here but when I was a kid we always used to get this TV guide called the TV Times and every time Chitty Chitty Bang Bang was on TV they would print like a review of the film and they would give it two stars out of five and quite a disparaging review and I always thought that was so unfair and I, I think the film you know deserves to be reevaluated and reappreciated. I really see no reason why this can't sit like quite proudly next to some, like, you know, classic family entertainment like The Sound of Music and Mary Poppins. So I'm curious to find out if there are any other uh, fans of this film out there, and especially from, like, parents, like, who are Bond fans. Like, if you've got young kids, would you, like, show this to your kids as sort of, like, an introduction to some of that Bond DNA that you just can't deny is in the film? I, I think it might be quite a good, um, sort of entry level into the world of Eon Bond. Please do let me know in the comments section below, and as always, please do head over onto my Patreon, Facebook, and Twitter pages to find out how you can support this channel, and please, if you've enjoyed this video, give it a like, give it a subscribe to this channel um, if you care to do so, and until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.